When Rubinstein the folklorist left Vilna to gather folklore somewhere else, the fish market was in turmoil. He'd been coming to the market regularly to collect curses, sayings, and aphorisms. Khan Merke, whose tub of fish stood at the entrance to the market, was the main source for his merchandise. Rubinstein had spent so much time collecting material from Khan Merke that a little romance had developed. She was smitten with the folklorist, even though one of his legs was a little shorter than the other. The other fishwives, especially pale Cyril, were expecting a wedding. But Rubinstein, the old bachelor, got scared. He went to the passageway, where they sold second-hand things, bought himself a green backpack, and limped away from Vilna, planning never to return. Had America took his disappearance very hard. Apart from the honor of someone like Rubinstein coming to visit her and polish off a bit of carp or savor a glass of tea with babka, he'd crawled into her very heart. A good few years had passed since her husband, Orca the Netcaster, had drowned in the Narocha Lake, and she longed for the warmth of another body. Apart from his leg, Rubinstein the folklorist was quite a presentable man. Hal America was impressed by his refined manners, the way he sat at the table without trying to lay a hand on her. But why has she bothered? It all came to nothing in the end anyway. Rubinstein had left Vilna and nothing more was heard from him. Hal America felt like a widow once again and tried drowning her sorrow in her tub of fish. Although she no longer let loose with humors, quips, and curses, every so often she still blurted out a saying strong enough to pierce a person's seventh rib. Sadly, not even a good day's earnings could lift her spirits. One winter Friday before Shabbos, Aunt America was cleaning a heap of minnows from her tub. Instead of hollering and sending the water gushing through the market, she just let it quietly trickle under people's feet. This didn't compare with her exploits when she'd been in her full glory and commander of the fish market. The other fishwives understood her mood full well. Khan America had dreamt a sweet dream, but it washed up on shore. Pale Cyril whose tub of fish stood next to Khan America's, ranted and raved. She hissed that they should have shortened Rubinstein's other leg before he started coming to the market to collect curses. Cyril didn't know how to comfort Khan America. Should she tell her that Usher, the clucker from the trade, after all, was pining after her? He was ready to take her exactly as she was, with only the shirt on her back. But Hannah Merke had experienced something better, a man who could hold a pen in his hand. Mm -hmm. So this would be no comfort to her. It's true that Usher the Clucker was a big shot in the fishing business, but he didn't compare to Rubinstein. Pale Cyril decided to have a talk with Hannah Merke. It makes no sense to eat yourself up alive because of the folklorist, that cripple. He didn't appreciate the curses and little jokes you gave him, or even a woman like yourself. You offered him his own plate and spoon and a good piece of fish. May he be well. But may he shit in his pants and have brown shoes at Passover. The two women were walking home from the market one sunny Friday. 
Chan America, who'd once been such a chatterbox, jabbering constantly, didn't utter a single word. Pale Cyril tried to cheer her up. Chan America, a curse on men. There are a lot more fish in the sea. You aren't ugly. You can certainly still say, Good morning, mirror. Pretty one, don't despair. Well, I gave that saying to Rubinstein to record. You're still talking about Rubinstein. Can't you get that cripple out of your head? He used up all your expressions and went somewhere else in search of another pack of used odds and ends. A plague is what he'll find to record outside Vilna. He'll have to limp around the entire region for a year to land what you gave him in a single week, and it won't have that special Vilna flavor. No, he once said that in Bialystok... What about Bialystok? How can Bialystok compare with Vilna. Here, you have the proof. That institute, well, now what's it called? The Yiddish Institute. See how easily you remember the name. Cyril marveled at her friend's memory. Exactly. They didn't build that institute in Bialystok, or in Grodne, or Greusvileka, but in Vilna, obviously, because Vilna is a city with curses, little jokes, and crazy people. It's unique. Vilna has what an institute like that needs. Well, what of it? He took what he found here and left for another city to gather stuff for the institute. So he left. You think the entire business will go under? Here, Cyril came up with a plan for her friend. Thanks to this plan, YIVO, the Yiddish Scientific Institute in Vilna, was enriched with a collection of curses, little jokes, and sayings truly to be envied. Cyril urged Khan Amerka to do nothing less than to set off for the Institute and tell them where their folklore came from. Everything Rubinstein brought them, he got from you. Why don't you offer to bring in the merchandise yourself and let Rubinstein bust a gut? There's no better way to take revenge on him. But Hannah Merka wasn't thinking about revenge. Her heart was broken. She'd grown accustomed to Rubinstein, and then he'd taken off and left the city. Hannah Merka figured... He didn't like her. Perhaps he thought she was beneath him. Why talk about revenge? But Anna America took up Cyril's plan for an entirely different reason. During the few months she'd spent with the folklorist, she'd become infected with the folklore bug. At first, she shrugged her shoulders, thinking, what's the point of all this? But gradually, she'd come to understand that all the curses, insults, biting expressions, and aphorisms could easily be forgotten. In years to come, people might think that life in Vilna had been dry and humorless, without cutting words, without hucksters who dragged customers into the shops from the street, without the Bobosnitz who sold boiled beans with little sayings and a little tune, without even the fish sellers in the Zarecha market. Hannah Merka was no simple peasant from the village. She'd managed to complete a few classes in the Devoire Kuperstein Folk School for Girls. Thanks to her teacher, Gershon Plundermacher, she'd learned to hold a pen in her hand. Rubenstein, the folklorist, had scratched off a bit of her crudeness, something a fishwife needs to earn her bit of bread. Some of the refinement that Hannah Merka had developed in school, particularly from Plundemacher's teachings, showed itself. One beautiful morning, Hannah Merka set off for the Institute to discuss the delivery of goods. I want to speak with the top boss. The top boss of the Institute was Dr. Max Weinreich. An ugly specimen known as Zelda the researcher quivered and fretted, why do people come here to pester Dr. Weinreich? But Hannah America didn't give up. Don't worry, I have rights at the Institute too. One word followed another. And soon people in the Institute realized that the woman with the gold front tooth 
was Rubinstein's folklore source. Her name did appear on his lists. When Rubinstein had been around, she'd been seen a few times standing outside the institute. Dr. Weinreich was delighted with Hannah Merke. He saw in her a confirmation of his theory that research without the common people isn't worth a groschen. He had recently written an article on that topic for the Institute Journal. Dr. Weinreich sat Hannah Merke down opposite his desk, wiped his glasses, and got down to business. Absolutely, you should bring in more material on all topics. Here in the Institute, we'll file it where it belongs. He assured her that what she had given Rubinstein was more precious than gold. Every curse and local expression is as sweet as sugar. America left the Institute feeling elated. Dr. Weinreich had said to her, Mrs. Soloduki, you possess the ultimate charm. After a single conversation with you, a person can string together a strand of precious Yiddish pearls. It was true. Hannah Merke had presented Dr. Weinreich with language that warmed his soul. The first list Hannah Merke supplied was Vilna Curses. She didn't submit all of them because well, some were too crude to say out loud, but she collected a pack of curses that were far from Rosh Hashanah greetings. They are, may you get a piece of straw in your eye and a splinter in your ear and not know which one to pull out first. How long do they think she'll be sick? If she's gonna lie in bed with a fever for another month, let the month last five weeks. May a fish ball get stuck in your throat. They should call a doctor for you in an emergency. And when he arrives, they should tell him he's no longer needed. May your teeth be pulled out on a winter's night and may you give birth on a summer's day. You should grow like an onion with your head in the ground. May all your teeth be pulled out except one and in that one you should have a toothache. Doctors should know you, and you should know doctors. May you speak so beautifully that only cats understand you. You should feel good, good and dead. May you be lucky and go crazy in a more important city than Vilna. And America wanted to add you should swallow an umbrella and it should open in your stomach. But then she remembered that everyone knew that curse. They, they'd even used it in the Yiddish theater. So she erased it. During the evenings, Hannah Merke sat in her tiny room on Yatkever Street preparing lists for the Jewish Institute. Dr. Weinreich had told her to write everything down. It was all useful merchandise. He suggested she compile a list of words related to fishing. What are the various tools called in Yiddish? He asked. Filling his order, Hannah Merke wrote, words used in fishing heard from my husband, Orca the netcaster, who drowned in the Narracha Lake. A Zvadnik someone who casts nets. Tonyevin, to pull the net out of the water. Dokshvenkin de Oijere, to traverse the lake from shore to shore with a net, literally to rinse the lake. When fish lay eggs, people say they're playing. As an added treat, Hannah Merke wrote out the names of different varieties of apples and pears. Types of apples, Tolska, Papinkas, Olivne, Sierra, Aporten, Chernorusn, types of pears, Margaratkas, Sapajankas, Buris. Hannah Merke collected the fruit names at the lumber market. 
when she started asking questions and writing the answers on a little piece of paper, the market women looked at each other over the tops of their baskets. They all felt badly that some cripple who'd also come around asking questions and jotting things down had hurt Chan America. Everyone in the Vilna markets knew her story, the story of Chan America and Rubinstein. The Institute was a buzz. The researchers and visiting students were enjoying the latest list of aphorisms that Chan America had provided. After each one was read aloud, the entire group exploded in laughter. Only Zelda, the researcher, the specialist in Jewish cuisine, made faces. <sighs> Khan America's collections are not scientifically sound and have not been collected with the appropriate methodology that proper ethnology demands. But prattling on with fancy terminology didn't help her. Dr. Weinreich said that Khan America's collections would be valued for their authenticity, specifically because they were taken directly from the mouths of the people. To acknowledge the importance of Khan America's material, he took the list of aphorisms in hand and read them aloud to everyone present. Everyone desires the nipple. A wife known as a blessing can sometimes be the greatest curse. In a fire, even the slop pail can help. Of an ugly girl, she looks like a cross-eyed herring on heels that are too high to be flat and too flat to be high. God pays honestly but he takes his time. A lowly boot also has ears. Even a humble hut has windows. A poor man complains when he has two weddings in one day. Where will he eat the next day? Even a thief should maintain his honor. If my grandmother had wheels, She'd be a locomotive. At this, Dr. Weinreich doubled over with laughter and stopped reading from the collection of Vilna aphorisms and sayings. One hot summer day, Hal America was standing next to her tub waiting for a customer to come along and buy her last few barbels at a bargain. She'd recently lost interest in the whole fishing business. Looking to switch to another line of work, she'd started hatching various plans. Itzke the redhead had offered her a share in his bar on Yakima Street, not far from her little room. Pale Cyril warned Khan America against it. A tub of fish is an honest business. If you don't like a customer, just chase her away with the tail of a carp, saying, Madam, buy smelts instead. This fish isn't for you. But all sorts of thugs come into a bar, and you have to put on a sweet face, wiggle your bottom, and ask them what they like, when really you'd like to see the back of them. Here at the tubs, the entire city knows you, Chan America. But at Itzke the Redheads, you'll be nothing more than Chan America the Waitress. So Chan America didn't take Itzke up on his offer but she no longer felt happy standing next to the tubs. When Rubenstein had spent time with her, she felt important. And at the Institute, they treated her like an empress fussing over her. Dr. Weinreich shook her hand. If only she could devote herself to folklore like the young men and women who worked at the Institute, but they were all so well-educated. She couldn't measure up to them. She had nothing but her tub of fish. Oh, Hannah America looked around for a customer. At one time, before she got involved with folklore, she'd lured her customers by yelling witty sayings and praising her merchandise to the sky. But now she ran a respectable business which was no good for a tub of fish. Pale Cyril fretted. She watched her friend sink lower and lower. 
Con America just wasn't the same. Cyril chastised her. The only gleam left is from the gold tooth in your mouth. Pretty soon you'll be like Zelda the researcher, that drab old maid. As Con America stood, gazing off into the distance, waiting for her final customer, she noticed in the distance at the edge of the market, a man walking towards her, dragging his stiff leg behind him. He stopped every 10 or 12 steps, perhaps because of the heat. As the limping wanderer trudged towards the row of tubs, the green backpack hanging off one of his shoulders shone in the sunlight. Hannah America stood at her tub absolutely still. She couldn't be wrong, it had to be Rubenstein. He was too close for her to be just imagining him. He kept walking until he stood right next to her. She didn't know what to do. She stood still, leaving it to Rubenstein to limp the last few steps and take her hand that was clenched around the edge of the tub. Rubenstein took the step. His hand clasped Hannah Merkis. They stood together without saying a word. They left talking for later. When they sat at the table in Hanemerka's tiny room, and Rubinstein enjoyed a glass of tea and a piece of gefilte fish. Du bist doch mein 